Yeah. Hello. We <laughs> get your cup of tea, Chad. We are. Yeah, sorry, I'm drinking way too much coffee already. <laughs> Interrupted me already, Chad. Let me do at least an introduction. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hello, everyone. We are live for the Courageous Leaders Club, and I am with the fantastic Chad Warner. Thank you so much for joining us today, Chad, and giving us your time. My pleasure, Joe. Wonderful. I'm glad you got your cup of tea and you're all ready. <laughs> So a bit about Chad before we start. Uh, Chad, as I would say, is one of the most passionate creatives I've ever worked with. ECD, rap, came over from New York to London. A big move for you doing that. Then a partner at, digital partner at CHI, integrated ECD at McCann. And more recently, uh, founder of WeVive, Chief Creative Officer. And I'm just going to sneak in there, so not to embarrass you or anything, but over 200 award wins for your no. work, which is incredible <laughs> so well done shared by, shared by many many other people, many, many people yeah. as all the walls are yes yeah. and if you're joining us live um if you want to leave any comments or ask questions while chad's here i'll keep my eye on the chat and we will try and ask some questions as we go along but chad this being the courageous leaders club if we just start off with what does courageous leadership mean to you I, I mean, I think that changes as you as you kind of get older. Um, mm -hmm. I think for for me, the, the most now what it, what is about letting well, if if you're a creative, for the most part, you're an executor for the majority of your life. And I think learning how to let go of the execution and trusting um, is is super important. It, it's basically you're not the answer, uh, and mm -hmm. I think that's a really tricky one to let go. Uh, that in fact, everybody else's is. is that you, you, it's not that you're not relevant. It's just you work for everyone else. You know, I mean, you're you're a fool to think that you know the, you know the the answer. And I think everything's so complex now yeah. that you know you you need more than ever the, the diversity uh, and, and the perspective of ideas because that's where great work comes from at the end of the day. So I think I think realizing that you are you're the catalyst to guide and to inspire and to make them happy if it make them feel happy is important um but i think that tr that that trust thing is huge now more than ever with covid um because if i mean as a parent i <laughs> it's it's just so daunting i mean that la last year was so incredible and um understanding that everybody's going through that whether you're a parent or not you're going through isolation or worries about how you can communicate better or are you doing better um i think learning to trust people and most importantly as a leader trusting that less is more is everything because yeah. the work the workload on creatives is uh, and everybody is insane you know, I think you and I were talking about it a couple of weeks ago where if you were in the office mm -hmm. and somebody was working from six o'clock in the morning, well, it's also making their kids were there and they were making breakfast and lunch and they were also educating and all that kind of stuff going in through 50,000 teams and Zooms calls and weren't leaving the office till eight o'clock, 10 o'clock. And they were doing that consistently for a year. Even the, even the most craziest ECD with their head up their ass would go, okay, well, this is, this is wrong. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so yeah. I think it's important that uh, you narrow the expectation of what you're expecting anybody to do and just cut the, cut it in half Yeah. because otherwise you're going to kill people. And I think there is a lot of people that are losing their spirit just because you're so out of, out of sight and out of mind. Yeah. And so it's, um, that's huge. Yeah. And that's a lovely answer. And when we were talking about it, it's saying a pattern that I'm seeing noticing a lot now is, which I've never heard from leaders before, especially people like in the teams, is we need boundaries. You yeah. know, that, that was not a word. That, that was just in the personal development world for so long. And now it's in the leadership and work environment is what are our boundaries anymore? You know, I was actually coaching someone yesterday who's like, I, well, I do a bit in bed before I even get up. I'm like, what? You haven't even had your breakfast yet. You haven't even got out of bed and you're working. You know, this expectation now that you, you need to be always on. Um, I just think that's a really good point with that workload and, and what's how that shifted. Yeah, it's funny. Boundaries used to be a different word, didn't it? You know, what I mean, you know, in, in my early years working in a strip club, it was it, made, it meant so, so much different. But I think even as you kind of kept on going, it was more about understanding the boundaries of what you could say or how you treat people. But um, and of course, but now it's evolved, I think, to um, the work life separation. But 
the thing you just mentioned, it's actually, there's also the, your, your inner boundaries about yes. forcing yourself to turn off. Yeah. Because it's so hard. It's so hard, especially here, because you, you essentially you don't have a, a physical detachment from work. I mean, a, any solid person that's obsessed and have a mental crazy worth ethic, which advertising pretty much demands, never really stops working in their brain, but it's a more abstract thing. Where yeah. here, it's, you're right, it's six o'clock in the morning. Um, yeah, yeah it's hard. Well, a lot of the leaders are saying we're telling our teams to stop, but they're not. So it is, I think, a lot of expectation and pressure people are putting on themselves as well because they're home. Well, sh shouldn't they just? They're available. They're not, you know, they're just at home. <laughs> yeah, but I, it's funny because I think if you talk to anybody that hears that, they go, yeah. oh, you know, fuck off. Like, it's so easy to say that. Is yeah. it? It's just so easy to say that. The only real meaning behind that is about acting on it, which is, again, it's lowering the workload, really understanding what everybody's working on, like really, really deeply understanding, which, you know, I think for an ECD, uh, sometimes isn't the biggest requirement, you know what I mean? And that's okay in that you, you almost don't want to be micromanaging. You know, Robin Lawl at McCann were really great about just letting people get on with it. And, um, but this time it's different. You you need to understand what everybody's working on so that you can have the sympathy because they're not going to come and tell you. No, no creative or anybody is mm -hmm. going to ever go to their boss and go, and I've got too much on. <laughs> it's never going to happen. It's just too embedded in who they are. And the reality is, is that I think leadership today more than ever has to be so transparent, so vulnerable in front of their team so that they get the permission to go, yeah, I'm scared. Do you know what I mean? I, I for, for my team now more than ever, I I probably overshare about my fears and you know the pressures I have and you know and moments where I feel I'm going to collapse inside. But that opens up the door for them, and then they mm -hmm. they spill it out, and then that's when you really get access to the truth, and then you can actually help people. So then maybe that you know turn off at work, you know, turn off more. That, that, you don't have to say that because you're turning them off by, you know, managing their time and your expectations of them. I'm just curious, Chad, because like when we work together, I've always seen you as, as, as a quite an open person and approachable person to work with. Is it something you've learned now you're, you know, you're running quite a big team to be more vulnerable? Did you have to learn that or is that just part of, because I've seen a lot of leaders are struggling with that vulnerability of that what I should be as a leader versus bringing me to my leadership. Was that a learned thing from you or just something you just naturally got inside you? You know, I think I've always been self-aware um, just yeah. because, you know, from, you know, just who I am, the, the body and the chemical makeup that I was born with is quite yeah. intense. Uh, and so it forces self-awareness, but I actually learned it. I think I learned it a lot in pitching. Um, and, and, and clients because, you know, self-deprecation is an amazing thing. <laughs> you can really break down a lot of walls really quickly. Um, and so I think if you can, uh, so in pitches, I would always kind of immediately kind of try to break myself down and create this concept of, you know, we're all equal and I'm, you know, I'm stupid and clumsy or whatever it is. Or most, when you get into America, I just immediately apologize for being an American, which always gets a laugh. And then that kind of breaks down the walls. And, you know, it's like even the CCO or the, the Samsung all of a sudden has a bit of giggle because, you know, they they understand that, you know, we're all just people at the end of the day. And I think that 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 then transcended over time to be more vulnerable. But there was there was definitely a gap where I didn't leverage that. Well, I didn't understand. Leverage sounds like it's a manipulation tool. I didn't understand the power of it. Yeah. Um, because if you, when you do let it go and you do open up, people see you for who you are and recognize themselves in, in, in you and the same, do you know, we, we all recognize our fears and our hopes and that kind of stuff and, the, and our, and an achy need for people to validate you or help you along. So I think it's an evolution. I think from a leadership perspective, your job is to bang that into everybody's head. You know, especially young, younger talent coming in and we're middle management, middle talent that yeah. just got one solid brief in and now they think that they're shit hot, uh, and, <laughs> which we all make those mistakes yeah. um, and just banging it in. It's like, mate, just just 
pull back and be vulnerable, be, yeah. people will open up a lot more to you. Yeah. And, you know, on the topic of courage, I'm a massive fan of uh, Brene Brown's work. And he literally says is you can't have courageous leadership without being vulnerable. They, they yeah. go, it's the vulnerability allows you to step into your courageous zone. So, yeah, they're so linked and tied together. Going, moving track a tiny bit, going about the courageous zone, you know, you went from huge success in advertising agency, you know, incredible work that you've done to suddenly taking a, a move to do a startup. Now, that must have been quite a courageous moment in your career. And I just would love to know what drove that? What was the purpose for you in terms of your growth and what you wanted to achieve from that? Uh, probably to piss Reagan off a lot, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, there's, there's nothing that will make your, your, your partner happier than having your paycheck or having would be a nice thing. Um, I, I think... Uh, I've always really been focused on kind of kind of top line objectives of what I want to, what I want to do and and how do I achieve kind of the the greater arc and I love building brands I I, I mean I I'm in a brand obsessive I believe that Suzanne Powers articulates it so brilliantly where you know your only aim is about a brand playing a meaningful role in people's lives and that can be at a brand level it can be at a cultural level but most of the time it's at a product level and that's a good thing. <laughs> so I've always just loved building brands and selling products. Yeah. Um, and then more recently, I think you've got to add the third thing on, which is culture. Um, but <clears throat> for me, I think what that translates into is understanding every angle of it, every single nook and cranny, because when you understand, you know, if you've already got the love for brand, but you, you will be the most successful you'll ever be in your career when you understand the perspectives of audiences, um, the teams that you're working on, the agency's ambition, yeah. but most importantly, your clients, you know, the real people that are confronted with a bunch of stuff that you don't know about, you know, they're people too, they've got bosses, they've got objectives, and a lot of it's like measuring things, which is difficult. and they're on the hook yeah. and your job is to kind of guide them on that. But I think if you don't understand all that, um, then it makes it really hard for you to kind of make great work. So I think to do the startup was that, sorry, that was a long tee up to where I wanted to go through the experience of really building a brand, coming up with a business idea, you know, kind of, designing it and coming up with this tone of voice I mean, for Weavy, you know, we Weavy's basic aim is to uh, help switch everybody in the UK to electric cars. And, and the, the the electric car shopping experience completely sucks. You've got to go from kind of site to site to site and they're not, you know, they're all talking in a different language. There's no one that just kind of brings all those things, all those cars together. And there's no one that really makes it easy to compare them and then speak to somebody that actually gives a crap about explaining EVs. Okay. And um, and so, you know, coming up with that brand, uh, our kind of our view is together we're electric. We do it one person at a time and then building the websites and literally learning code again uh, and then building up a small team, getting some success and then going and doing fundraising. Like fundraising is so mental. You learn yeah. so much about how to clearly articulate your product and show the value uh, at a commercial level, but at a brand level and the role it plays mm -hmm. and then getting a couple million quid and growing it up to 75 people, you know I mean, during COVID, all of that stuff. I knew that if I went through it, I would go back into advertising with such a clear understanding of how everybody needs to yeah. tick off every single box for you to do great work. Um, and so that was kind of the, the big, and make to make no money. Honestly, to make zero money. <laughs> well, the business terms, makes money, but you don't make shit. In terms of the the value for you as a person, though, you know that must have been such a growth because <laughs> I know you know I started my own business three years ago. Yeah, it's very different from going to get your regular paycheck every month. You just get your holiday form signed. You know where you are. You've got certainty, stability, security, teammates around you. To suddenly you're out there on your own wearing a million different hats that you've never done before. The value to you as a person and in your leadership to now what you can bring, what were the, what's the greatest value for you in the big learnings? Uh, I think 
giving giving up your the idea immediately to mm -hmm. everybody else i think was is yeah. was critical um uh, have huge ambition, but um, really, really don't focus on measurement. I think measurement and success are the biggest pitfalls you could ever do because they, they're they impossible to measure. They end up, it's like politics. You'll never win because it's so, it's so subjective. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you free anybody of the idea that you are either going to be successful or not, because a big part of startups is KPIs. Everything's KPIs. Yeah. Yeah. Measurement. I mean, it's like I learned how to, you know, create campaigns and Google and AdWords and algorithms and click through rates and, you know, all of that stuff. It allows you to believe that anything is measurable. But the reality is, is that, you know, you can run an ad and you can do all kinds of different tests, but it still is about, you know, that person or the moment in time. You know, what I mean, if if I ran the same ad, you know, two years ago, well, there would be a different, a whole different perception to somebody looking to get a car during COVID and they're worried about weeks from now being put on furlough. Yeah. So their engagement or their committal or their conversion rate is going to be different. So you're measuring off of that and you go, well, it's just stop, stop. Yeah. Your objective is to create, is to drive traffic and yeah. to learn about something. You know what I mean? And, you know, Weave is a very performance marketing based thing, which is really fun. But man, it's really fun to build brands and do really cool things <laughs> also. Um, uh, and so when you, when you let people be free of that, that idea that they are measured by numbers. You need some of that, but but that in fact, their measurement is about achieving something, achieving a, a goal. We want to get this many things on the site or we want to do this many ads or whatever it is. Those micro achievements are far more freeing than, yeah. than uh, coming up with some odd way of measuring success because yeah. inevitably there's a thousand different ways to do it. Yeah, so not locking, not being rigid in your thinking, just allowing allowing things i like that idea of freeing because i you know same for me when i do my marketing if i keep you just got to keep testing keep testing keep it i'm like oh okay <laughs> yeah. just keep going I mean, it could be like that saturday was the sunniest saturday in the 12 months and you're like yeah that i had no control over that <laughs> but sure as shit nobody's looking for a bloody electric car on a saturday when it's sunny outside do you know what i mean it is what it is so you gotta you gotta jump with that you gotta let it go and that's what I, you know, that thing of control. Um, you shared a story with me before, part one of your other learnings on how you, you know, you did all that work to set it up, and then people start to come in, and that that learning you had of needing to let go of that control. And you mentioned it briefly a minute ago of it's handing it over to them. What was that? What was that like for you to go through that? Because a lot of leaders hang on to control. Control keeps them safe. So that moment where you did learn to go, do you know, it is about letting go and handing it over. Can you tell us a bit about that experience? Um, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually quite simple. I think, I think when you are doing a startup, you really are starting with like you and your two partners. So yeah. it's anybody that comes on is a blessing, first of all. But I mean, it, it really is as, as, as simple as, you you work for everybody you know you can't do whatever you're trying to do um without everybody but i think the biggest the big the biggest thing is realizing again that they're just people and they have the same things going on as you are so when as a leader you i found it was really it's really a, a huge shift to go from the executor and the one that did it and you know feels like your it was your idea to becoming somebody that only takes pleasure in everybody else's success. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and when you get to that moment, you, it, it's so it's so amazing because you you get all your ego out of the way, you know, yeah. and you you realize that it's so much better when people do great work because yeah. of maybe where you guided them, but where most yeah. importantly, how you showed them that they can be absolutely amazing and, uh, and that they can do things that they never thought they could do. I mean, honestly, it's incredible how much you can do. <laughs> I mean, it really is. As long as you're, again, as long as you're, 
smart about it commercially as long as you're looking at it from the brand and the client and a product and an audience and i know that sounds like a long list but yeah. you know as long as you're kind of realizing the role that that work plays i mean it, it's you, you it's just so much fun because it's, it's actually quite easy and when you watch and allow people to figure that out for themselves and guide them there yeah. that's way better than you doing it do you yeah. know what i mean it's, it's kind of it's, it's it's falling in love with the the idea that you're not winning and everybody else's. Yeah, and I think that for me is real true leadership. It's about others, not you. And I think that, that gift in when you see someone, that belief, you know, giving someone that belief that they can do it and then they believe themselves that they can do it and they see it and then to celebrate and acknowledge them for that moment, I just think as a leader, that's got to be one of the highest moments you can have when you can see someone's belief just go through the roof on what they can achieve and do. So I think that's lovely that you give that to people. Why is it I've been so fascinated with in your career? You know, you really are a change agent, a change inspirer. And, you you know, you if you go into companies with that kind of expectation of, can you help us move this forward? Or can you help us introduce something new or some new way of thinking? What have been your learnings going into different companies and needing to work with different type of people to get them to want to change or be inspired by the work you can do? How's that transition in your leadership worked for you? Um, did I already talk about self-perception? No, that was before <laughs> me and you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, there's, there's two folds, really. I think one is going in with whatever your objective is. Mm. Um, but then I think self-perception, Rob Riley, which, you know, you, we both had the pleasure of, he was yeah. the CCO of McCann uh, World Group. and and him along with Suzanne Powers, two incredibly huge forces that were taught everybody how single-minded objectives, yeah. uh, like one single-minded objective can transform everything. You know, Rob's his creativity can, is the only thing to survive. So he did, you know, Road to Can and all that kind of stuff. And, and Suzanne uh, was about, you know, just pounding in, you know, that it's all about brands playing meaningful roles in people's lives. But there was a story that Rob told in front of some big town hall that I loved because, and I'll tell it wrong, but the short answer was one day mid, mid career, somebody had come to him and said, you know, just, just so I, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of people think you're an asshole. Um, and, and he was floored by it. Yeah. And because, you know, when you're, when you're in, when you're in your lane and you're doing really well, you, it's so easy to get lost. And you're, you, you're kind of, you're creating this narrative of what, what your role is and the impact you can have. And you get start getting, you know, awards and you're working with more creative people and so on. And that whole thing was for him was a game changer. And so kind of self-perception is, is kind of everything because the, the reality is, is that if, in, until you really realize what your strengths are and what yeah. your weaknesses are. <clears throat> but I think more importantly, probably what your natural behaviors are, the things that you can't change about yourself. Yeah. Until you figure that out, you can't really connect with people and you can't really get to a point where you feel like you can do something really productive because the only way that you're going to do something productive is by doing it with other people. Yeah. And, you know, and so when, when you, when you come in with your agenda, yeah. uh, you will quite, I, I, th I think I did a bit of that. I learned a little of that from McCann, you know what yeah. I mean? It, it, you know, trying to, trying to get everybody to think a different, not a different way, but in more of, uh, you know, evolving their thinking about, you know, there's not a singular idea doesn't necessarily live in one yeah. medium, but it lives in many and, you got to start from the bottom because that's where everybody's conversations is. Everybody's on phones and you got to spread it out and messages or reach and frequency and that kind of stuff. And that's how you build brands and, and connect, connect with people. How you do that it has to be on an individual level. And you've got to really realize the things that can be really annoying to certain people. You yeah. know what I mean? So your traditional creative is probably a bit anti-technology and like things that Facebook might be whatever. Um, your uh, excitement for that platform is going to be annoying. <laughs> Whereas if you position it through the kind of lens of purity and creativity, 
yeah. and how you can start to use different boxes and tell stories over longer periods of time. Well, then you're singing the tune that they like. Whereas if you're trying to connect with a Theo, you know, yeah. a planner as a strategist, it's about, you know, their passion for human insights and culture and that kind of stuff. And uh, whereas media is one thing and all the other kind of stuff, clients are about performance, but building brands and understanding all these channels, clients are in the worst situation because they've got all these people <laughs> swirling around them. Uh, and they just need a partner to give them, you know, the answer. So I think if you understand yourself, yeah, um, and what can, and then you the focus on focusing on people's own weaknesses and fears and the things that they might be frustrated about you, then I think you then you're you're ha you you got you're halfway there. You're halfway yeah, there. Definitely. and what you're describing is a lot of the work I do is behavioral flexibility. Is you don't <laughs> walk in like, this yeah. one way of being. It is recognizing that we're not all the same and we all have very different maps of the world and see the world differently. And what I'm also hearing, Chad, is that power of your words and your language is recognizing what language and how you enter somebody else's world so they can hear you and they can understand you yeah. and connect with you. Um, and, you know, and human beings, all they want is, to, is connection and to know they matter. And we can do that so much in our leadership with the words we choose to use because we've taken the time to understand somebody. And not yeah. make it who we are. Cheryl, you know, Cheryl, at, there was the CEO of McCann. Is, you know her. She's yeah. such an incredible character. Yeah. So smart. But her approach to leadership is individual relationships. Yeah. Like 100%. And, yeah. you know, but, you know, somebody, whoever's replacing Alex Lubar as an example, sure as shit better be bringing, you know, that kind of game. But you immediately realize that. So for them to connect with you, it could be at a standing at a town hall making gags and jokes. But that wasn't her. She over invested in talking to people individually and building individual relationships. And she always figured out your style. Yeah. I mean, literally, she, she, she figured out my style of comedy and the balance of passion versus bullshit talking and and then she just leaned into that yeah and i love her because of it and i listen to her because of it and she's a mentor because of it and you know and, and like it's just so it's everything yeah. it's everything and that's what i love and I, I i work with so many leaders and they're so stuck in the weeds of the day to day and i'm like no look up look at your people learn your people your time is so precious with your people that's where you're going to see the difference um and i yeah. think show such a fantastic demonstration of that is she's such a people oriented such a people orientated leadership approach uh, which makes all the difference thank you the question i always love to finish with is you've got so much wisdom now in everything you've done you, you know i love your sort of for me your sort of tank your tagline is a bit all angles you've really gone around and seen all angles of how human behavior is people is work is tech media you've you cover everything, which I think is wonderful, and that wisdom and now that teaching you can give to others. What would have been one thing now, if you could go back in time and give your younger self a bit of advice, what would that be? Uh, probably shut up, but um, <laughs> shut, shut up a lot more. Yeah. Um, I, it would be it would be running towards mentors. I think. Yeah. Um, I think when you're in your in your earlier years, uh, you think that you have to be the answer, that you have to know everything. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, because I was focused a lot on like integrated and understanding technology and how you kind of do some creative stuff with that, um, it felt like I needed to be the authority. But the reality is that um, you learn so much more from mentors than than anything else, uh, yeah. and. The, the thing about leaders is that, and people with experience, almost no matter how long, how, how, how long they've been in the business, is that they, they're gagging to teach you yeah. um, and, and share that because you can do, you can go, I, I'll save you a year right now. I mean, like right now, you're, you can spend an entire year doing this or you can skip that whole thing by listening to it. But you can also do it in just by being in proximity. Yeah. Um, so I was a bit late to that, but I think getting time with with spending time more with with your your leadership, going in front of them and being completely transparent, um, because they've all been there. Uh, yeah. I mean, I th I think I 
I, I probably took up day smoking because of John Burley at CHI because you know I wanted to be around him a lot more and then he would sit outside at a coffee shop and smoke a lot and so I would sit there and learn about you know unique using craftsmanship and just have a slightly unique twist on every piece of work you know Ian Hayworth you know was, was about pace and talent Hornby and Sarah Golding was about like broader opportunity and constantly evolving yourself Riley and you know Suzanne were about you know that kind of single-minded stuff yeah um Robin Lal you know completely being letting people get on with it and so when you just get in front of them and just say like dude I can I just hang out with you a bit more or I don't know what I'm doing yeah oh, their heart just blows up they're like oh my god <laughs> I'll come and give you a big, big mentor wisdom hug. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think it's so invaluable. It's it's everything. If I did that, if I started that 15 years earlier out of the last 25 years, yeah. I'd be in so I'd be in a better place. But I'm yeah. happy with where I'm at. You know, noble truths and all. Yeah, I fully agree with you. I wish I'd have got mentors much much earlier on rather than trying to figure it out on my own. And it really is transformational there's absolutely no way that i'd be doing my own business now if it wasn't for mentorship and being asked and i don't think there's any age where you don't ask for help or any role where you there's not somebody you can go and ask for help with or get support with um being your younger but self no. like your career but i think people want to share you know uh you know men like men in the last like, like unconscious bias as a term was this opened up a, a whole new perspective for me. It was the catalyst. And it created all these conversations between uh, men talking inwardly and going like, shit, you know, have I been doing this a lot? Like, and yeah, I have. And oh my God, I realized this and one of those. But equally, you know, just going to, going to women or going to people yeah. that um, have just different ethnicities or backgrounds and those kinds of things. Going to them and, and being transparent, like they the 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 incredible cultural agendas that are going on right now are huge, and but they they all come with people talking, and yeah. the most important people that should be talking are the ones that are scared to ask. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? The, the kind of that fear of going, well, just, just because you're black and I'm going to ask that question and I'm white, I'm not going to do it because it's going to feel weird. But the reality is, is that the only way that you can make change is by asking the questions that you're scared of and realizing, and, and you know, whomever the, that, you know, whatever is the issue and the central of those issues and the people that are trying to overcome them or, de or define them, they want to talk about them. They're worried about the fears that you have and they're trying to help overcome them. Yes. And that, that if you can really get past that, oh man, you it's you magic. you will stand up all. It's magic. It's magic because yeah. you're not scared of anything then. No, exactly. And that and that, that mindset of curiosity and letting go of those fears of being wrong and being judged and just putting yourself forward. That's really where mm -hmm. the magic transformation can happen for you. And just being all of you, which I think is wonderful. Chad, thank you so so much. Is there any final parting words you want to share before we close? Um, <laughs> I do. I do think it's important to just always re remember that uh, you can you can genuinely do anything, um, mm -hmm. big or small. Yeah. But uh, it, the moment you free up the idea that it's yours, you yeah. know that ambition is yours and that idea is yours. That in fact it's everybody else's. I think that it's so much more fun. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? To, to not be this lone soldier with this lone agenda. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so maybe it's that. That's probably. Nice. Or go out for a walk and breathe some fresh air. Fresh air. Breathing is breath. brilliant. Keeps Breath. me calm. <laughs> keep, <laughs> keep, keep, keep going. Keep me alive. Yeah, Keeps me going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and be funny. Laugh. <laughs> Yay. No, we need to get some playfulness back in. It's been such a tough time. It's how, how do we get that playfulness back in? And you know, really focusing on that joy. I work with a company, actually, their value is joy. And I just love it because they really make sure that they, where's that joy? Is that going to bring us joy? Is, is that experience bring joy? And they really live that value of joy, which is just wonderful to see. And you can see it in how they work. And I just think we need a bit more joy now back in this year. Yeah. And how can we bring that to, that to our teams and bring it into the leadership? 
Chad, thank you so much. I wish you all the success in the future. I loved working with you and I'm inspired every time we talk. So yeah. thank you. Good luck. And we'll speak soon. Thank you for all watching right. everyone. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.